Welcome to Drive the DAF. Clear, structured explanation of the daily DAF in 20 minutes. You can even follow in the car. Sechus Eirvin DAF Yud Zayin contains a Mishnah. And then it ends the first parak of Masechas Eirvin and begins the second parak. So we have three separate, we have three separate discussions here. And the first one from the beginning of the daf until the Mishnah is three mini sugyas, all surrounding the sugya, the issue of a weak wall. We had seen that a wall which is made of only vertical sticks or only horizontal ropes is considered weak, and it's limited in its use. It can't be used for a large enclosure. We had four opinions in the Mishnah, what it's good for, what it's not good for. We're focusing here, in our first sugya, we're focusing on the opinion of Rabbi Yaisi Barabi Huda, who said that if you're making this enclosure for three people, so then you have up to six base saw. Six base saw. Six base saw. That is a base sasayim two saw for each person. You have three people, two saw for each, six saw altogether. This measure means the amount of land in which you could plant a saw of grain, in which you could plant a two saw of grain, and that is about 5,000 square amas. So now the Gemara says that Rav Gidl said in the name of Rav, that even though we have this halacha, that for three people, you, you, you could have a weak enclosure, and it works for up until six base so, but sometimes five will be no good. If you have an enclosure for three people of five base so, it'll be no good. You won't be able to carry that. And sometimes it'll be even seven base so in that enclosure for only three people, and it will be good. So Gemara expresses shock about this. Gemara says, could it be there? I've said that. And Rav Gidl said, I swear to you, on a Torah Navi Miksuvim that he said it. So Rav Asher says, it's not a kasha. It makes a lot of sense. What's the logic over here? When you say that three people get six base saw, that means there isn't an automatic number. Each person gets two base saw automatically. Each person gets as much as they need. Sometimes people will need more, and sometimes people will need less. When is it puzzle? It's puzzle if the enclosure contains within it a base sasayim that's not needed by anybody. So now let's work through the cases. Let's say you have six people and they each need a base sasayim. They each need two saw, 5,000 square amas. And you enclosed seven saw. You have, so you have one extra saw. So they each need, so six of them are needed. There's only one saw extra. That's not enough extra to puzzle the whole enclosure. It's only one saw extra. And it's only possible if you have two saw in this enclosure that are not needed by anybody. So therefore you have seven saw enclosed, and it's not a problem, even though it's only for three people, because you only have one extra unused saw. How can you have five? That's a problem. Simple, I have three people, and they don't need a full base to sign each. Each one needs less. And I have an actual base to sign two saws worth, which is totally unneeded. Situation like that, this entire enclosure is possible. Because you have base sasayim in it, which is not needed. And Ravashi goes on to explain that it doesn't go by a person automatically. It goes by not having an unused base sasayim within your enclosure. Whenever you have an unused base sasayim within your enclosure, it's a psal on the entire enclosure. Okay, now the Gemara wants to know, let's say the number of people in this enclosure changed on Shabbos. Let's say one person died and another person came into the group. So now the question is, you originally had three people when Shabbos began. Now in the middle of Shabbos, the number went down to two people. Is it permitted because Shabbos started with three people and therefore the wall was good when Shabbos began? This weak wall was good because I needed all the space within it. I had three people here who needed the space. Or do we say, no, it doesn't go by Shabbos. It goes by now. And in the exact moment that the person died, we no longer needed all the space. We no longer needed all the space. That means there's extra space. That means this weak wall is enclosing too large a space. And now this Erev is puzzle. So Gemara says this machak is between Rav Huna and Rav Yitzchak. One says that it goes by the beginning of Shabbos. If it's mutter in the beginning of Shabbos, it's mutter the whole Shabbos. And the other one says, no, it goes by hour to hour. You have to have the number of people that are enough to use all the space. If you have too much empty space, it's no good even if it starts in the middle of Shabbos. So Gemara says, we don't know who said what. 
Let's try to prove it by having a statement of Rav Huna in a similar halacha. There's a similar discussion about when you make an air of chatzeris, you need to have, if you have two courtyards, two chatzeris, you want to be able to carry from one to the other, you have to make an air of chatzeris. In order for the air of chatzeris to work, you need a doorway between the two chatzeris to exist. That doorway has to be at least four tfachim by four tfachim. So let's say you made an air of chatzeris in the beginning of Shabbos, and in the middle, that doorway collapsed, or it got stuffed up with rocks that fell. Now you don't have a doorway anymore. So you had a doorway in the beginning of Shabbos, you don't have a doorway now. What's it relevant? It's relevant if you have smaller windows, can you carry through those windows or not? So, uh, Rav Huna says that it goes by the beginning of Shabbos. Since the beginning of Shabbos it was okay, so now it's okay the rest of Shabbos. So the Gemara says, yes, this is a good proof. Rav Huna is the one who says that it goes by the beginning of Shabbos. Now the Gemara says, I have another, third sugi, which is very similar, and this is a Mechlekes Tanayim. We're based on Rabbi Yehuda against um, Rabbi Yehuda, uh, Rabbi Yehuda against Rabbi Yehuda, and it's a similar discussion. And let's maybe see this machlekes Amiraim, Rav Huna, and Rav Yitzchak maybe lines up exactly with this machlekes Tanaim. What's the machlekes Tanaim about? It's about if you have a chutzer, a mavoi, or a house that walls fell down, and now it's not enclosed properly anymore. At the beginning of Shabbos, it was enclosed. The mavoi had a lechi, the chutzer had walls, the house had walls, and then walls fell down, the lechi fell down. Now in the middle of Shabbos, it's not good anymore. So the machlekes, Rabbi Huda says it's okay. Because in the beginning of Shabbos it was okay, so it's good for the rest of Shabbos. Rabbi Yossi says, what kind of business? There's no such thing. If it's uh, if it would be good the whole Shabbos, then it will be good forever. It's, it's not good. It's not good. It's not good. This Shabbos is not good. Next Shabbos, it doesn't help you that in the beginning of Shabbos it was good. It was okay. So the Gemara wants to say so. This lines up with this Machlech, Rav Huna, and Rav Yitzchak. If the beginning of Shabbos makes it good for the whole Shabbos, the Gemara says, no, it doesn't line up. The Gemara says, no, actually, each Amara fits with the opinion of the Tano seems to be opposite him. How so? Rav Huna will tell you, I fit even according to Rav Yaisi. I say that when the when Shabbos begins, it's good, it's good, the whole Shabbos. Rav Yaisi will agree with me. The only reason, in his case, he said it's no good, because the walls are gone. I mean, the walls are gone. He can't tell me that it's still good, the rest of Shabbos. But in our case, the walls are still up. They're, they're weak walls, but the walls are up. The only problem is the amount of people became less. So that wouldn't be such an issue when he would agree with me that that's okay. And Rabbi Yitzchak will tell you is that I say in this case that it's no good. Rav, even Rabbi Yehuda will agree with me that it's no good in my case, the case where the number of people disappeared. The only reason why in his case he said that it's still good is because the people are still there. But here the people actually went and they disappeared and they're gone. And therefore he'll agree with me even in my case. Okay, now we get to the third discussion over here. And this is a brief one. In our Mishnah, we had four opinions as to uh, what a weak wall that's made of only vertical or only horizontal slats, what is that good for? And the first opinion and the fourth opinion seem to be the same. What was the language? The first opinion um, was the Tanakama, and they said as follows. They said that when the Mishnah said that you're allowed to use a weak wall, for a caravan, it was Lav Dafka, a caravan. It wasn't specifically three people camping in a caravan. Not specifically. It could be used for anybody. And what's the language of the fourth opinion, the Chachamim? They say that a, a, a weak wall, which is only vertical or only horizontal, is good in all scenarios. So all you need is one, either vertical or horizontal. You don't need to have both together. So it seems like the same opinion. Where says there's a difference. The difference is what happens when you have one person who is in a city. He's not out camping in the in the field. The Tanakama said that it's good when you have three people camping in the field, Lav Dafka three people, even if it's only one person camping in the field. Ah, but that's only if a person's camping in the field. If you have someone who's in the city and he could make a normal wall and he goes ahead and he makes a weak wall, that's no good. And on that, the Chachamah would argue, they would say, no, that's good, even even inside the city, one person is good, it's not a problem, in all scenarios, it's okay. But that's the difference, one person in the city, that's where they would argue. We now get to the last Mishnah in the parak, and coming on the heels of the Mishnah, which discussed a caravan which camped in the field, this Mishnah discusses the halachas of soldiers who are camping in the field, and special leniencies that they have, one of them is related to 
a Reuven, but the primary subject will go afield. The Gemara will discuss the special lenities for soldiers, why it's special for soldiers, and where it comes from. So the mission says that there are four special lachas for soldiers that are on the way to fight. First of all, they are allowed to steal wood, allowed to take anybody's wood. They do not have to wash Natila Sidaim. They are allowed to eat Demai. Demai is food which is bought from an Amara, somebody who we suspect doesn't take Miser. And Midra Banon, we're obligated to take Miser from it again. We can't eat it until we do. That Iser Dera Banon doesn't apply to soldiers. And they also do not have to make an Erev. The Gemara will clarify what kind of Erev. So before going further, the Gemara brings a Brisa, which has similar lachas. The Brisa says, soldiers on the way to war are allowed to steal wood even dried wood. Um, Rabbi Yehuda ben Tema says they're allowed to park themselves in camp wherever they want, even on a private property. And the third halacha that the Brisa brings is that where they are fallen, where they are killed, you bury them right there in that spot. And they that land becomes their grave, even if it's private land. So Gemara asks that a number of these halachas aren't specific to soldiers. Yeshua ben Nun made a few takanas, he made it ten takanas, and these three are included in them. It applies to everybody. What are those takanas? So he said that you're allowed to graze your animals in somebody else's forest. Nobody plants in the forest. You're allowed to graze there. So um, that was one thing he said. He also said you're allowed to gather wood from somebody else's field. Because you don't have to worry about stealing the wood. So what's the chiddush that the soldiers are allowed to steal the wood? So the Gemara gives three answers. The Gemara says Yeshua only said it about thorns and thistles here where talking about actual branches are allowed to take or maybe the answer is is that um, Yeshua only said you're allowed to chop wood but to take already chopped wood you're not allowed but soldiers are allowed or maybe Yeshua said you're only allowed to take moist wood but already dried wood which the owner invested effort into you're not allowed to but soldiers are allowed to the next thing is Allah the Yehuda ben Tema said that they are allowed to uh, be buried wherever they are killed. So Mar says that's obvious also. A soldier who is killed in a war is a mes mitzvah. And the Allah is that a mes mitzvah is buried in the spot where he falls. He owns that land. It's given to him. And you're allowed to bury him there. So why should, what's the special chiddush for soldiers? So Mar says, no, we're referring to a soldier who's not a mes mitzvah. A mes mitzvah is defined as somebody who, there is nobody who is willing to bury him. There are no inheritors. There are no ears, and they're not going to bury him. But this soldier has people who are happy to bury him, therefore he's not a mace mitzvah. Okay, now the Gemara asks, is it really true that a mace mitzvah is buried in the exact spot where he falls? We have a b'risa that says you're allowed to move a mace mitzvah to somewhere else. The b'risa says if you find a mace on the road, you move him to the side of the road, left side, or the right side. If you find him in... Uh, on the line between a planted field and a field that's going to lie fallow, you bury him in the fallow field. If it's a field that's already growing and a field that's just plowed, you bury him in the plowed field. If it's on the line between two fields that are the same, you can move him to whichever field you want. So you see, you're allowed to move a mace mitzvah. So how can you tell me that it's in the spot where, that he falls, he owns? So my answer is this, the situation here was where he fell on a road. And the, the the field's case was also there was a road between the fields. And you don't want a maze buried on the road because then Kahanim won't be able to travel there. And therefore, you're allowed to move him. Now, once you're allowed to move him, you're allowed to move him to whichever field you prefer. Okay, back to the Mishnah. We had seen that the halacha was that they don't have to do nitilas yidayim. Abayah says that's only mayim rishayim washing before bread. However, mayim acharnim washing afterwards, that is obligatory. Everybody's obligated to do that, even soldiers. And the reason is because that in salt, in every... A uh, container of salt is a little bit of melach sedimus, salt from sedim, which is very painful to the eyes. It causes blindness if it if it would get into the eyes. And people have it a little bit of it on their fingers. We're concerned after the meal because they eat salt at the end of the meal, or they put salt on things at the end of the meal. We don't want them to touch their eyes. Therefore, we say you have to wash their fingers at the end of the meal, and that applies even to soldiers. We don't want soldiers getting blind any more than anybody else. And Mrs. Rav Achabed the Rava asked Rav Ashi, "What if you go you measure salt out for your animals? Does that mean you have to wash your hands also?" And he said, "No, it's only after a meal you have to wash your hands." Okay. Next thought on the Mishnah was that they are lady demai. So Gemara brings a brisa. You're allowed to feed the mai to poor people. You're allowed to feed the mai to soldiers that are quartered in your house. 
And Rav Huna says, no, 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 this is not exactly how it was. It's not just a straight up mission. It's actually Mechok is Beishamay and Beishil. Beishamay says you're not allowed to do these two things. And Beishil says you are allowed to do these two things. Next, Allah in the mission was that they, the soldiers do not have to make an Eruv. So Gemara says that's only referring to an Eruv Chatseris, which is a Derabonon, but a Ruvi Tchumin, connecting the areas that they're allowed to walk so that they shouldn't walk more than 2,000 Amas, that's a Deraisa. The Torah says, Al Yetzi Yishim Yimukayim Yibim Mashabas. According to at least Rabbianai, that means that there is an Isser Deraisa of leaving your Tchum. The Gemara brings a Braisa to prove this. It's a Braisa quoting Rabbi Chia. Who says that you actually get Malkus for violating Tchumen? So, there's a few questions on this. First of all, the phrase is Al Yese Ish It doesn't say Lo Yese Ish. Al, you don't get Malkus for. So, Gemara says, first of all, you do get Malkus for. Like it says, Al Tifnu Al Oives Val Yudainim. Don't go to witchcraft and sorcerers. That you certainly get Malkus for that. So, the Gemara changes the question. The Gemara says, no, you can't get Malkus for. Al Yetzi Ishmim Kaimi, the Gemara understands that the phrase is meant to be Al Yetzi Ishmim Kaimi, a person should not carry on Chavez. So you can't get Malkus for that because carrying is something which has a Chiv Misa. You get Skila for carrying on Chavez. You don't get Malkus if you get Skila. So Gemara says, no, it doesn't say Al Yetzi, it says Al Yetzi. It's not an Isra of carrying that's being referred to here, it's referring to just going outside the Tchum. And that is the end of Perek Mavishu Gavoya. Now we start the next in Perek, which is Perek Oisin. The Mishnah discusses the halachos of travelers on the way to Yerushalayim who needed to stop in order to collect water. Uh, and the problem was is that they often stopped on Shabbos, and the water at the bottom of a well is, is in a Rishus Hayachid, because the well is four Tvachim wide. And it is more than 10 Tvachim deep. Now, the outside of the well, the ground around it, is a Rishos Harabim. So to draw water out of the well and feed the animals or feed themselves outside of the well is transferring from Rishos Yachat to a Rishos Harabim. So they had trouble getting water. So Chazal made a special Takana that they're allowed to make a very rudimentary wall around the well. And that'll make that entire area within the wall into Rishos Yachat. And they're allowed to draw water out of the well to within those walls. So this mission discusses how those walls were made, what they needed to look like, what is the minimum that you could use for them, how big they were allowed to be, how small they are allowed to be, and how uh, what the dimensions of the boards are. So the mission begins and it says that you don't have to make a full wall. All you have to make is four corner pieces. That means that you set up a square around the well, but you don't need to fill in the entire square. You just put in the corners. You set up four L-shaped pieces, in one in each corner, and the corner pieces, each leg of the corner is an ama wide. It is at least 10 tvachim high, and it could be any thickness. Uh, Rabbi Huda says it that way. Rabbi Meir says you have to put in uh, four more flat pieces between the corners, meaning along the sides of the square, not just the corners, along the sides of the square, you have to add another four flats, one on each side. The Gemara will explain why and wherefore he needs those. Now, how far apart should these boards be? The corners, or the spaces between the corner and the flats, according to Rabbi Meir. So the Gemara says, Machlaik is here. According to Tanakama, it should be enough for two stalls of animals with three cows in each, which is a total of ten Amis. According to, uh, that's Rabbi Meir again, and according to Rabbi Yehuda, it's, it could be enough for four animals that are tied a bunch close to, together, but are loosely enough that you can move one in and out, and the Gemara will explain that that's 13 and a third Amis. Now, how small is this enclosure allowed to be? The Gemara says it could be as small as you want, and just make sure there's enough room for your animal to come in to the enclosure, at least his head and the majority of his body, in order that he's able to drink from water that you take out of the well. If it's too small in that, we're afraid you're going to end up moving the water to outside this enclosure, and that would be carrying and defeat the purpose. Now, how far, how big is this enclosure allowed to be? So this is, again, a machlok between uh, the Chachamim and Rabbi Huda. The Chachamim say you can go as far as you want. So to make sure that the gap between the boards is not more than 10 amas or 13 and a half amas, depending who you hold like. So, therefore, if you're going to make it a very large enclosure, you're going to need to add more sideboards so that the gaps aren't too big. According to Rabbi Yehuda, there's a limit here. It cannot be bigger than a base of Sasayim. 
That's the size that we had for weak walls and all kinds of other weak enclosures, which is 5,000 square amas. So now the Gemara says, well, what was the conversation between Rabbi Huda and the Chachamim? The Chachamim said, listen, a base asayim is only for an area that's not really supposed to enclose, an area which doesn't serve a purpose for people or animals to live in or do home functions. Such as a storage place where they used to keep the wood, that's a karfeif, or a gina, a field. That's not really a place where you live. That's where we set a limit of 5,000 square amas. But a place where people live or animals live and function, such as a barn or a place where you keep your animals in the village or a backyard or a front yard, all these places, there is no limit. You could have 5 core, 10 core, whatever you want. Um, and on that, Rabbi Huda said, no, this is like a... Uh, Car faith, and therefore the limit is five thousand. Drive the Daf is a project of the Grand Woodland School and is presented by Rabbi Yitzchak Landa. Find us on YouTube or subscribe to daily emails by emailing drive the at gmail.com.